Hi, and welcome to tonight's webinar on you nutrition and health. I'm Jody Rosay O'Brien, and I manage the Sheep Connect Pastoral Project, and I'll be hosting tonight's webinar. So, just some background about what is Sheep Connect. Um, if you're not familiar with what it is before and heard of it before, it's an extension project which gives opportunities to producers to be involved in programs which um, involve positive change on farm in both production and management practices. So we have two programs, both in the pastoral and the agricultural areas of South Australia. You can find out more information about Sheep Connect at our website, sheepconnectsa.com.au. And if you're on Twitter, I encourage you to follow us at Sheep Connect SA. So projects such as Sheep Connect is not possible without our funding partners, AWI, Primary Industries and Regions SA, and the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund. Just like you take a moment to read the screen in front of you. Tonight's webinar, we have two speakers. Um, we have Colin Trengrove um, from Pro Ag Consulting, and we have Hamish Dixon from Agri Partner Consulting. And it's my pleasure to introduce Hamish to start our webinar off this evening. No problems. Okay, look, thanks very much for um, for the invitation to speak tonight. And certainly, um, look, it's a, it's a good topic to be covering off, and it's a topic that has been um, fairly red hot for probably the last few months with the way the conditions have been. So, look, tonight, um, in terms of my session, I'm going to go through a little bit more around the nutrition side of things and management of ewes leading up to lambing. And then, certainly now, we've got quite a few flocks across the state that have been through lambing and quite often up to marking point now. So we will talk about nutrition into lactation and, and how some of those components come into play. And importantly, we're going to go through a little bit on how do we assess supplementary feeding options. So for many of you, you've been working through these thought processes, no doubt, over the last few months. Um, it's still potentially on the cards for a lot of places for another month or two in, in many situations in terms of having to continue supplementary feeding. So. Um, it's an important important discussion point and equally I think there's probably some um, learnings that we're finding out over this season as well and potentially some of the things that we discussed tonight might help um, sort of turn on a few light bulbs about why you might have been seeing different responses in the flocks that you've got. We go through those supplementary feeding options um, and also we'll just talk a little bit around um, feeding strategies and what it might look like going forward from here as well. So um, look we're not going to spend too much time on, on really what the current situation is. Um, you're all well aware of where we're at rainfall wise, feed wise, importantly where our stock are at. But it is actually, I guess, quite pertinent just to have a look at, you know, where do we sit in the scale of rainfall deficiency across the state and where is it located and where are the biggest issues that we're seeing. This is rainfall deficiencies from the start of the year to now. And certainly it's changed a little bit in the last month or two in some places. But when you look at it over that extended period, it is, it is, is actually quite bad in a lot of regions. Um, and equally for South Australia, this is this is fairly widespread compared to other some other states as well. But this is largely explaining why there's been a huge amount of supplementary feeding going on this year. Um, it's equally explaining why it's been very difficult to source some types of supplementary feed as well, particularly over the last couple of months. So one of the things I guess that is a really important discussion point before we get into the real detail of supplementary feeding is how do we actually look at justifying the effort and the cost that's involved in these strategies that we're going to talk about around particularly nutrition and management of stock. And I think this is a really critical component of, of this whole discussion because one of the things that I've seen happening over the last couple of months is we're having lots of discussions with clients and producers about, well, when do we actually start to rein back the cost? You know, how far is too far? And when can we stop it? And it is actually a really important thing to have a clear business target or a business goal um, for the sheep enterprise. And that might be things around labour efficiency. It might be around trying to optimise gross margin. Um, it might be looking at what production or what income we're trying to target for wool versus meat. All of those targets and having goals about where we're trying to take the business to is a really critical part of actually working through and being confident with feeding decisions that you make, not only in a normal year, whatever that is, but also in these sorts of tight seasons where the feed costs can start to escalate. If you've got really clear goals, and importantly, if you've got the cost benefits of those goals sitting behind the scenes in your head or in the computer somewhere, you can start to really be confident because you can calculate the cost benefit of whatever supplementary feeding strategy you're taking. And in that instance, it actually allows you to be very happy with 
the feeding and the amount of feeding that it sometimes requires, particularly for high production animals. So it is a really important part and I think it, it's something that we need to look at more as producers is to actually make sure that we have a long-term strategy and, and really clear targets for what we're trying to do production-wise. Um, and once we have those targets and we need the plan of how we're going to execute it, you know, what are we going to do management-wise to, to pick up 10% in reproduction rates, to put another half kilo wool cut on use? Whatever those targets are, we have to have the plan and then it allows you to know what the benefit is going to be, what's the upside from production and income and therefore how much money can we throw at it while still actually getting a good return as well. So looking at lambing so far, look, there's lots of places, particularly our autumn lambing flocks, we're starting to get good information in now on where the marking results are at. And, and to be honest, it's coming in fairly variable. We're getting some really good lambing results, some really high lamb survival rates, which is almost surprising in these sorts of seasons, but in some, some ways it's not. We've had really quite beautiful lambing weather across many areas of the state. It's been quite mild in most areas. If we get things like that right, if we get the mob size and density, we get the management right around health, largely the performance of lambing then starts to come down to the main factors around nutrition. So if we're seeing these big variations in, in marking percentages this year, I think obviously a large part of that is coming down to the nutrition and feed available. So we start to dig into how we can manage that better. And if we're looking at doing that, really it comes down to three key steps. One is understanding what are the animal requirements. Then it's understanding what's the feed available to them. And then understanding is there a surplus or a deficit that we need to manage. Okay, and certainly in years like this, there's often the deficits around things like energy and protein that we need to deal with to really try and optimise production. One of the really key points of this and, and why the old picture of the barrel is still incredibly applicable these days is that, especially in seasons like this, there are a number of things that are limiting production. And to actually get the best cost benefit, we need to be really clear on what is the biggest limitation, what is the biggest handbrake nutritionally to stock and making sure that we target that first. In this sort of situation, if you look at that barrel where we have low rungs for energy and protein, okay, protein is the lowest rung there and that's what's actually allowing that leakage out of the system. That's the biggest handbrake on the system in that. So we need to look at dealing with protein first. Then we deal with energy. And things like some of our trace minerals in that, in that example, things like zinc and copper and sodium and iron, addressing those minerals first is going to give very, very little cost benefit. It's going to give you very little return. So we need to be really clear on what is the, actually the biggest limitation on the system at any one point in time to get the best cost benefit out of any sort of nutrition strategy. So if we're looking at nutritional requirements, some of the main things that we always look at are these components here that are on the screen and, and they are probably quite purposefully in, in order. One is looking at dry matter intake and that's just how many kilograms of feed an animal is eating. And it seems really obvious but quite often it's, it's missed. Now in seasons where we have short or little or no paddock feed availability, clearly there's an issue there. But even as we start to move into you know, periods now where we're getting some feed starting to come through in many regions, that limitation in terms of how much is available to the animal still needs to be considered. Equally, if we're looking earlier in the season when we had very dry feed, we need to think about what issues there might be with dry matter intake in terms of things like high fibre content limiting dry matter intake. And equally tonight we're talking about you know, nutrition around late pregnancy, lambing and lactation. And if we have a ewe that's carrying twin lambs on board, she has reduced room and capacity. So there's an issue or a limitation there in terms of how many kilograms of feed an animal can consume when they've got two lambs inside that are pushing up against the room and up against the stomach and are, and are reducing that capacity a little bit. So one of the very simple things we always have to look at is, is can they actually achieve, can they eat as much as they're looking for? The next thing that we look at is what is energy influence? You know, how do we manage the energy intake of the animal? And when we're talking about use, energy is one of the most critical things we look at because it's the main driver in fat deposition. So when we measure body condition score in use, one of the main components of that that we're measuring is basically the fat layer on, on the animal. How much fat is she covering? Is she, is she carrying for us? As an energy reserve, that's a really important component of production. So if we're trying to put body condition on animals, we have to make sure that we're driving energy into the system. Whereas protein is really important in terms of muscle development, it's really important in terms of wool production and certainly for flocks where, we're, where we've been in an autumn landing situation, it's critical, critically important now in terms of milk production. So those two main components of nutrition need to be thought of in terms of what their role is and it's also important to think about that in terms of how we manage the feeding. 
because if we have an animal that has a high demand for energy, so think typically mature animals that have had a lot of their, their main development, they've, they've developed a lot of their own muscle and bone already, and the energy is just going to, to putting on fat, putting on condition, then we need to come in with high energy and potentially lower protein feeds. So that's where cereal grains come into play. So in that situation, if we were just trying to put body condition score on use, you wouldn't be coming in with a high rate of lupins, which are high in protein, for example. The other thing that we think about is MDF, which is neutral detergent fibre, which is one of our measures of fibre. And it's an important one that gives us some good indication as to how much of a particular feed an animal can eat. So the higher that MDF, which is a percentage, so zero to 100, the higher that number goes, the less of the feed an animal can eat. And we'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a minute around how we can use that number to see whether particular supplementary feeds might be suitable or not. Minerals and vitamins, certainly in seasons like this, are still really important. And particularly when we're supplementary feeding really heavily with cereal grains, there are some issues with calcium. And I think Colin will touch on that a little bit later on as well. But they're certainly an important part of managing livestock in seasons like this. But they certainly aren't the main priority. Now, we have to make sure that the core components and nutrition things around how many kilograms of feed, what the energy intake is, what the protein intake of the animal is, those are the main things to tick off and then we address minerals and vitamins after that. So if we work through the example of meeting energy requirements for an animal, we have pretty good information available from a range of sources and, and Lifetime U is, is one source that, that I'm sure some of you on the, on the call at least would have been through. And it gives us the really good information around exactly what is the requirements for energy, for metabolizable energy of use at varying stages of pregnancy, lambing and lactation. And you can see on the screen there where the different requirements sit from a dry to single to twin. And that grey flat line across the screen is the dry requirement, which is basically the same as what we're saying from maintenance. And one of the ways to think about this is that maintenance energy cost is an overhead of your system. Right? That energy cost in there is there every day of the year and it's an overhead that you want to try and split and spread over as much production as you possibly can. And it's one of the reasons why producing as many lambs as possible, trying to push for high percentages of twins in the, in the system is very, very cost effective and starts to generate much more profit because we're spreading out that overhead cost of maintenance of animals. But you can see the jump up as we go from, from maintenance of dry into late pregnancy to lambing and in that early lactation stage where requirements peak for singles and twins. And it's actually very interesting when you start to look at the difference between singles and twins and it's actually reasonably significant. It's one of the reasons why we have challenges around trying to meet twin lamb survival targets because we're often not quite getting to the, to the higher requirement of twin bearing ewes. But you can see that we peak around that late pregnancy and lambing time and then we peak, sorry we don't peak then but we're building requirements through that late pregnancy stage and peaking in, in early lactation. And one of the things that's actually important to think about is what are the processes going on throughout pregnancy in terms of fetal development, in terms of what we need to think about when we are managing feeding throughout pregnancy. Because there are aspects of nutrition throughout pregnancy that will affect not only the lamb in terms of its growth and development, but subsequent progeny generations as well. We know there are multi-generational effects in terms of the nutrition of how we manage the nutrition of ewes to the effect on not only their lamb, but their lamb's lambs down the line. So one of the things that comes out of having a really good understanding of, of what goes on throughout fetal development is the hard answer is there isn't a really great way or isn't a great shortcut throughout any stage of pregnancy that we can afford to back off on nutrition. Okay, and it's not about throwing huge amounts of supplementary feed at animals all the time, but it's about ensuring that we meet requirements. Fortunately, with livestock, with sheep and cattle, it's the late pregnancy stage that we have the most significant increase in requirements. Throughout early and mid-pregnancy, requirements don't increase a huge amount over maintenance. It's a gradual build, but it is still really important to meet requirements. And one of the points that's actually very um, critical to be thinking about in a meat production sense is that muscle cell formation in lambs and in calves is laid, is, is laid down, all those muscle cells are laid down, mostly through the early stages of mid-pregnancy. So those muscle cells are laid down there and then once they get to late pregnancy, those muscle cells grow, which is when a lot of that fetal growth is occurring. But if we limit nutrition throughout that mid-pregnancy stage, we're limiting the number of muscle cells that can be laid down on that lamb and we're limiting the potential carcass weight and growth of those lambs once they're on the ground. As we come into late pregnancy, we have to really closely manage nutrition of ewes because it's the most critical point 
in terms of actually having a successful lambing. And it's also one of the most critical points in terms of having good lamb development from a colostrum production point of view. So the lambs are born, they get some colostrum, they have high levels of immunity. Um, and certainly once they get those first feeds, they have a much higher chance of actually going on to turn into successful weaners. If the ewes have low levels of nutrition throughout late pregnancy, they're often in lower condition, they produce less milk, the lambs are at a lighter weight at weaning time and their survival rates post weaning are much lower as well. So if there's one point in time that I absolutely think it's critical to get right, is to have use as best as possible we, we can in terms of coming into late pregnancy in good, in good condition, but making sure that we meet that increasing requirements in late pregnancy leading up to lambing time. Interestingly enough, this year, if we overlay what we've had in terms of pasture growth rate with that calendar, if we look at, say, an autumn lambing situation, which, which this timeline is looking at in terms of, a, say, a May lambing, this is pasture from space pasture growth rate data. Now, the numbers on the side there are 0, 5, 10, 15 and 20. Now, typically, we'd see that, that scale or the top number there, the 20 probably should be closer to an 80 or 100. But because we've had such low growth this year, the scale is actually way down. But you can see we really didn't get very much growth at all across a whole range of regions here. And I've just picked four, four regions here, which you can see in the different colours. And really, we didn't get any growth. We had a bit of a kick in May and that quietened off fairly quickly. And it hasn't been until, realistically, June onwards that we've had any level of growth and if you look at the actual numbers of sort of the five to maybe 10 kilos per head per hectare per day, so that's pasture growth, it's still fairly minimal. So at, throughout this whole pregnancy and lambing period, we've actually had very limited growth, which you're well aware of. And to do this, we have to achieve, and to achieve these high levels of, of, of uh, lambing performance, we still have to be able to meet the requirements whether it's coming from, from paddock feed or if we haven't got the growth like we have in this season, we still have to be able to work out how we can manage that nutrition through supplementary feed. So if the available feed is not there, then we have to start looking at how we manage it through supplementary feeding as well. Now this year, if we've had, say, an earlier lambing, an autumn lambing flock, you may have had some dry feed coming through the earlier stages of, of late pregnancy. If you are a later lambing flock where you're looking at, say, lambing in a July, August, um, type time frame than potentially starting to get some green feed on the ground. But we're going to go through the scenario probably of a, of a system where we're looking at minimal paddock feed coming into the system and using that as an example. So quite often when we're looking at that dry feed, we're looking at, at pasture quality figures of energy of anywhere from sort of six and a half to seven ME and protein figures often down three to four, maybe 5% protein, which is quite low. And in some situations, by the time we get to autumn, and especially if we've had any sort of summer rainfall over it and we've leached out the protein, those figures can be lower in some seasons as well. So typically, if we haven't got much volume of dry feed and the quality is low, we often won't allocate very much quality or, or total energy intake from that pasture. We're gonna work through a couple of scenarios here for singles and twins looking at what is their energy requirement. So we're gonna step through those three steps that we looked at in terms of what's the animal requirements, what's the available feed that they have in front of them, and what's the potential deficit and how do we deal with it. So if we've got singles here, the energy requirements that we're looking at for these at around lambing time is say 15 megajoules of energy per day. And for twins, we're gonna call it about 20 megajoules of energy per day, okay, at lambing time. So pasture quite often when it's limited in amount and low quality, will typically put around two megajoules of intake available on that. So you can see it doesn't contribute a huge amount to the system at this point. So for singles, we have a deficit here of 13 megajoules of metabolizable energy, which is our, the way we, we talk about energy in ruminants, a deficit of 13 ME. Now, probably across the state, we've seen a range of supplementary feeding strategies from some people using hay to some people using grain to pellets probably quite a lot this year as well. But in the scenario of hay, if we take, say, something like cereal hay, if it has an average energy content of 8 ME, so for every kilogram of dry matter, for every kilo of, of feed of that hay, it has 8 megajoules of energy, then to achieve 13 megajoules of intake for that single U, they have to be able to eat 1.63 kilograms. So that's a fair whack of it. And for twins, to make up that 18 megajoule deficit, they have to eat 2.25 kilograms. Okay, so that's quite a large amount of hay. 
One of the challenges with hay is that we have a high fibre content and often that can be a limitation to intake. So they can't physically eat a huge amount of that, that hay. The better the quality of the hay, the lower the fibre content, often the more they can eat. But you've all seen it also equally in poor quality hay that they leave a fair bit of it behind and they can't consume high amounts of it. We spoke briefly before about the neutral detergent fibre figure, the NDF. And that's a figure that you'll get back from a test result of hay. And if we take the example of the NDF being 65% for a cereal, we can use an equation which is 120 over 65, which is the NDF, gives us 1.85%. What that's telling us is that those sheep could eat 1.85% of their live weight of that feed and no more. So the higher that NDF goes, the less of that feed an animal will eat. So if we take the example of a 65 kilo ewe, 65 kilos by 1.85% means that that ewe can eat 1.2 kilograms of that feed at most. So in the row above where we looked at saying if the hay is 8 me, they need to eat 1.6 kilos or 2.25, we now know based on the fibre content of that hay that they won't get anywhere near it. Okay, they simply will not be able to meet those requirements. So if they eat 1.2 kilograms, that's the most they can consume, then that's going to contribute 9.6 megajoules to the diet. That still means in singles in that scenario, we're short 3.4 megajoules per day. And in twins, we're short 8.4 megajoules per day. May not sound like a huge amount, but when you actually look at it, look at it as a percentage of their total daily energy requirement, for singles, we're short 23% of their requirement. And for twins, we're short over 40%. So that's a big shortfall in terms of trying to meet their energy requirements. If we start to be deficient in energy, like we talked about before, the result is we start to see decreases in condition score. And a lot of the lifetime wool research has shown us very clear relationships between the effect of body condition score at landing time and the resulting land survival rates. Singles are relatively resilient and we tend to be able to push our singles harder than our twins. And this is where often we have to make sure that when we're setting up lambing, that we're setting up the strategy around single and twin management as best as possible. So with those sorts of deficits, we know with the twins where we're missing 40% of their requirements, we're going to see the condition score of those ewes start to fall quite rapidly. And if we start to see those ewes at lambing time come down to say score two, rather than score three, then we've instantly dropped 20% lamb survival in those twins. So we can start to see why we're, we're having issues with twin lamb survival in the industry and why we're not commonly meeting those requirements. So to achieve those requirements, the alternative is we start to come in with something like a grain which has a higher energy content. So to meet the single requirements, to meet that, that deficit of 13 megajoules for singles, if the grain we were looking at was 13 ME, that's clearly one kilogram of feed that they'd be looking at on a dry matter basis. They'd still convert that to an as fed, scenario depending on what the dry matter content of the feed is um, but we have to discuss that a bit more in, in questions if needs be but we're looking at one kilo of, of that grain at 13 me or 1.4 kilos if we're trying to meet the requirements of twins okay so that's effectively a full hand feeding scenario where we have very little contribution coming from paddock feed and it starts to show where the requirements of sheep sit for trying to achieve high levels of production it also starts to show us why commonly we're not quite getting there. You know, there's not a lot of places where we're actually commonly feeding, you know, well over a kilo of, of grain of, of, um, of grain to stock to actually achieve high levels of production. You know, but the positive thing is in years like this where we actually have, and for the last few years, we've had good life, livestock prices, these sorts of decisions are actually paying. Okay, and where we're having places that we're actually getting these sorts of feeding strategies correct, and we're getting high levels of, of reproductive success, they're getting the payback despite these fairly high levels of, of feeding required. It also starts to show one of the decisions around where you sit lambing time-wise. Okay, with an autumn lambing flock, you're constantly going to be in these sorts of situations where there is some level of supplementary feeding required leading up to lambing and through lambing time. Um, and in really tight years like this, clearly it, it starts to escalate up further and further. So one of the things to think about this year is also how do we actually compare different feeds available to us? 
One of the really important things is we have to start by being very clear on what are the requirements of the animals that we're trying to, to meet. And that will be for things like energy, and we've gone through that scenario looking at energy, but there's also some consideration that's required in terms of meeting protein requirements of stock. So just as we have those requirements for energy, we have requirements for protein that you can work through the same sort of process with. So the starting point is to know what are the requirements we're trying to hit and what general type of feed mix is going to meet the requirements. So it might be that you need a component of cereal grain with some legume, or potentially there's a pellet that actually meets the requirements overall, or potentially a grain with a small component of a particular type of hay. Those sorts of scenarios can all be played with once you have a clear understanding of what the quality of feed available to you is of supplementary feeds, and equally once you have a clear understanding of what the requirements of those animals are. The best place to start once you get to that point is to actually look at what the cost efficiency of different feed options are to you based on a unit of energy and a unit of protein basis. So you can clearly see once you start to get to something like legume grain, if that's valued at $480 a tonne, those grey bars in the graph at the bottom is the feed cost in dollars per megajoule of energy and also in feed cost in terms of per unit of protein. So you can see with something like a legume grain, clearly it has a low protein cost. That's why that yellow bar is low. Okay, It has a low cost for protein delivery, which makes sense because our legume grains have a high protein content. And equally something like a legume grey, uh, legume hay, sorry, is our second lowest protein feed available there. But looking at trying to deliver energy, some of the cost efficient feeds in that scenario is something like a cereal grain. Cereal hay is relatively close there. Legume grains still have a high energy content, but one of the issues with legume grains is typically their cost per tonne is still quite high. So they're still very much driven at providing protein to the system. One of the surprising ones that often comes up is straw. Well, because it is so cheap per tonne, and whilst it still does have very low energy content, its cost per unit of energy is actually still quite good. But the issue with straw is they just can never eat enough of it to make much difference. So the cost per unit is a useful starting point, but don't forget that things like how much of it they can eat still come into play as well. In a season like this, one of the important things that we've had to deal with is how do we manage feed on offer as well. So we have to look at how do we actually achieve sufficient paddock feed once we do get the break and how do we have sufficient feed to manage production of animals. So in a year like this we really need at least 500 kilos of dry matter available to stock before we want them going on to paddocks and before we want them going on to you know, things like our grazing crops and grazing cereals. If we don't have that available to us and we're keeping any green pick that's starting to come through really short, we're hammering it down. All that happens is we start to keep that green feed really short because they never gets the chance, the plants never get the chance to actually develop any leaf area to capture sunlight and to increase their growth rates again. We're far better off in these types of seasons keeping stock off feed paddocks for a few weeks longer to try and ensure that we have sufficient green feed there for them to go on to before it's actually grazed. Those couple of pictures that are on the screen are very, very common situations that we have um, across the state in many regions um, around that sort of May, June, July time. And as much as possible, we want to try and avoid it. Particularly with lambing ewes coming from a dry feed onto short green pick, there are lots of health issues that can come into play and Colin will touch on some of those. But in terms of the feeding strategy, containment areas play a really critical role in managing nutrition of stock at the break of the season as well whether it's late in a year like this or whether we're in a normal season. So a containment area that gives us an, a, a, a confined space that we can hold stock off those paddocks and we can manage their nutrition separately can allow those paddocks to get away and allow stock to do far better nutritionally on them and equally allow the pastures to grow faster throughout winter and spring and it grow a higher amount of total dry matter over the course of the year as well. The pasture growth rate that we can achieve is actually really important in terms of being able to grow sufficient feed on offer to get stock onto those paddocks in the first place. The later the break and the colder the conditions get, generally the slower that pasture growth rate is going to be. And that's a really challenging situation to be in because it actually slows down or increases the number of days that it takes for us to build any level of feed wedge in front of animals. The red line there at 500 kilograms of feed on offer is really where we want to get to at a minimum. 
if we want to grow that from whenever we have a rainfall event, if our pastures are growing at 10 kilograms per hectare per day, it's taking us 50 days to get to that point. So that's a long period of time. And that's really the least amount that we want to get stock onto. If we're trying to get up to almost a tonne of feed on offer, then you can see that with slow growth rates, it takes a very, very long time for, for that pasture to get to that point. So we really want to be able to maximise pasture growth rates. And part of that is allowing those pastures to have an increased leaf area, capture more sunlight, and then exponentially increase their growth rate as well. So containment areas are a really important part of, of managing nutrition, not only just in, in seasons where we have a late break, but it can also play a part in many normal seasons as well. In years like this where we're, we're having to confine animals right up to the point of lambing, ideally we have systems that we can allow stock out prior to lambing. We don't necessarily want to be lambing in containment um, if we don't have to, but in really tight years like this, if we have to, it's not the end of the world, but there are some really key strategies that need to be put in place in terms of how we manage the animals, who preferentially gets more, allocate, more space allocated to them, who potentially goes out into some small holding paddocks. So there's some really key things that come into play, but as much as possible, we want to avoid it. But if we get pushed into a corner, we can certainly do it. I think really in terms of how we manage nutrition of ewes through seasons like this, the really key points is to have a clear production goal. And that's really important in terms of continued feeding strategies. In years like this where we're feeding for months and months and months, it's really easy to get to the point where we wonder, can we actually just stop feeding yet? And if we do it too soon, we undo a lot of the good that we've already done to that point. If we slow down the feeding of ewes in that late pregnancy stage or we don't meet requirements, but we've been feeding them all the way up to that point, We've set those ewes up for a really successful lambing. And if we put the brakes on at that point, then often we undo a lot of the good that we've already got to that point. And then it becomes really costly at that stage. If we're going to put in a system where a strategy is to feed the ewes through lambing, then we need to have that strategy sound. We need to know that the cost return is going to be there and we need to stick with it. We need to make sure that we're removing any passengers out of the system. So dry ewes have got to go. You know, we have to make sure that we only have our most productive animals in the system because if we're going to be putting in extra cost in terms of feeding, we don't want to be doing it to any animals that, that aren't productive. Managing the nutrition as cost effectively as possible is a really important part. And part of that is making sure that we have the nutrition balanced. Often where I get feedback from people saying, oh, look, we fed this, this and this, and it didn't really seem to work and it was too costly and we didn't get a return. When we dig into the details of what happened, it's commonly because the wrong feed has been fed in the wrong place. If we put the right feed in the right place, there is generally always a good return from it. So we need to make sure it's managed properly. Think about holding paddocks and containment. Um, we're starting to come out of that phase now, but if you weren't doing it this year, think about whether it might be a system for the future for you. And certainly think about animal health and, and Colin will, will touch on some of those in a moment, which is, which is a good sort of follow on from what we've been talking about. So I think with that, we'll take a few questions and, um, and go on from there. Thanks Hamish, we have questions coming in. Um, please type your questions in and we'll um, send those through to Hamish. I'll ask them of Hamish. Hamish, the first one is the pastures that we've got at the moment, how are the dry conditions affecting of the quality and the nutrition value of them? Yeah, look, look there's, there's positives and negatives, I think, coming through this year. Um, we've, we've got slightly probably warmer soil temperatures than we've seen traditionally because we've, we've still had quite mild conditions. Um, we've had a few good frosts in, in different parts of the state, but generally the, the sun's been out afterwards and it's kept things moving. Um, look, the moisture's certainly clearly been limiting, um, but the positives out of pasture quality in that sense is generally we have lower dry matter, um, or sorry, a lower, uh, a higher dry matter content, lower moisture, which is not necessarily a bad thing for pastures. One of the issues with with short grain feed is that it's it's full of water, and that just means that animals have to eat a huge amount of it to achieve their total kilos of intake. So if it's a little bit dry, that's not a bad thing. Um, one of the things that tends to occur is if we start to have slower growth rates in those pastures because it's been limited by moisture, then commonly the, the quality will be back a little bit as well. So we're seeing probably from the, the test that we've had anyway, 
energy is, is probably a touch lower than where we commonly see it. So if we say a typical fresh green pick might be say 11 MA, you know, we're, we're probably commonly getting tests in at, at 10.6 to 10.7, so it's just a touch under. It's also the protein is in that same ballpark a little bit, so the protein's back a little bit, but equally that doesn't really concern me because I think in a lot of senses, you know, the protein content of, of green feed is well in excess of, of what we require for most classes of sheep anyway, so um, I don't think that's too much of a concern. Excellent. Thanks, Hamish. Um, the next question is about where people have got, where I've got um, high fibre feed, how might I use molasses in that and what are the costs and risks such as using molasses in our systems? Yeah, so so supplementing with molasses, which is which effectively just is an energy source, um, it can help to increase intake of high fibre feeds a little bit, certainly. Um, what happens is if we can provide, well, if we have stock that are, that have access to high fibre feed, whether it be either, either hay or straw or dry paddock feed, if we can put some extra energy into the rumen, what happens is we tend to fire up the rumen bugs and their populations increase. They tend to be able to digest that high fibre feed more quickly, which means that the animal can consume more because there's a higher passage rate. The limitation can be that the animal or those rumen bugs in particular require energy and protein. So if they're on dry high fibre feed that is low in protein, just going in with energy, which is your molasses, won't give as good a result as if you went in with energy and protein. So in some situations, that's why things like your molasses and urea come together. Um, part of the discussion then or the decision-making process is whether the molasses is the most cost-effective option for you. And that then comes down to working out what is the cost per unit of energy. And equally for something like if there's a small amount of urea going in, is that the most cost-effective way of delivering units of protein? Um, so in small amounts, they, they can be not too bad, but typically uh, where we can source grain, and I know that's been a limitation this year in, in many, many areas, uh, grain is, is still often the most cost effective energy and protein deliverer, even once, even when the, the per tonne prices are, are going up quite a lot. Um, I think equally we saw this year um, pellets were, were getting used an awful lot because we just couldn't source grain. Um, but yeah, the things with, with molasses is, is is clearly it's still a fairly expensive energy supply, and if we're trying to deliver huge amounts, so you know we're just simply not going to be. If we're looking at feeding, say a kilo of grain, we won't get there with with molasses. Okay, thanks for that, Hamish. Um, please keep sending your questions through. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Colin Trengrove to talk about um. You health, um, but keep your questions going coming through because um, we'll have a panel session with both Hamish and Colin at the end. So please do. There's some great ones coming through, um, so keep sending them in. So um, it's now my pleasure to um, introduce our next panelist this evening, um, Colin. Okay, so thank you very much, Jody, and um, evening to everyone. Uh, so that was a very good introduction by Hamish, and uh, I think what I'm about to present will complement that nicely. Uh, so certainly, the, uh, a lot of the issues I'm going to discuss is really obviously very, very much related to what um, Hamish has just been through. So uh, starting off, um, I'd like to uh, talk about the following topics. If I can get my screen to work. Here we go. So um, pregnancy toxemia is obviously uh, probably paramount of all the issues that we might encounter in these uh, tough times. And uh, I'll follow that with uh, a bit about hypocalcemia or milk fever. Um, enterotoxemia is always one of those issues that might bob up. Mastitis has certainly been an issue in recent times. Uh, pink eye we tend to see a lot in uh, under dry, dusty conditions, but also in a lot of stressful situations. And then I'll just finish off with uh, disease prevention strategies. So somewhat similar to what uh, Hamish has presented, the, uh, I just wanted to go briefly through that energy for pregnancy and lactation. And so just highlighting the fact that, you know, how much energy is required by the um, pregnant and then lactating you. So if we say, for example, uh, say a 60 kilogram sheep might need about eight megajoules a day or a bit, bit more. That equates to about one DSE or dry sheep equivalent. And then as we approach the last six weeks of pregnancy, that energy demand uh, goes up quite dramatically, 50% increase in the last six weeks when 
uh, effectively um, a U with a single lamb, the energy requirements go up by 50%, a U with a twin lamb goes up by about 75%. And so there's a dramatic jump here we can see from say around about 8 megajoules up to about 12 megajoules. And then in the lactation period, uh, we see that um, for a single a ewe with a single lamb, uh, the uh, total energy increase from uh, being a dry at maintenance is about 250% or 2.5 dSc. Or if in, or if the ewe has actually got um, twins, uh, then the uh, increase is actually three and a half dScs or or 350% from the um, dry state. So it just highlights the fact that there's a huge energy demand and in good years or normal years, ideally we're lambing down on green feed and uh, green feed provides an, an immense amount of energy to usually or very much meet those needs. So I mean, there's always um, a requirement for some of the condition or fat on the back of the animal to um, fill in the shortfall. But by and large, if we can lamb down with a bit of green feed around that, uh, can make up that deficit in the energy needs uh, quite um, satisfactorily. Okay, if we look at it from another perspective, just from uh, the feed in the paddock, and we know that obviously there hasn't been a lot of feed in the paddock since um, the start of the year, but this graph here is uh, just to highlight how the uh, the pasture digestibility or the energy content of the feed declines quite um, steadily from the uh, spring through drying off down to uh, the end of um, autumn. And uh, so if we start off at say um, around about uh, the autumn break, or should I say sorry, the autumn break, the, um, the drying off after spring, we see that the energy value of the feed is around about eight to nine megajoules, which is about what um, Hamish pointed out that um, you know, good quality pasture is worth, uh, good quality hay is worth. Uh, and then it's a, it's a steady decline thereafter. So it reduces by about 5% a month. So we go through the uh, summer months, and we just see here that the uh, energy drops off from eight to seven to six to five. Uh, and uh, obviously, as the dry feed disappears altogether, well, then there's, we have to replace it with supplements. And of course, most people have been supplementing livestock now for probably the majority of this year, uh, given the situation we've had across southern Australia. So then if we talk about um, what's the impact on ewes, uh, and so this illustration here uh, taken from the Lifetime Wool Program uh, highlights that um, an animal that uh, might be in say a condition score two and a half, uh, we see here that there's quite significant mortality even at that uh, level where a, a twin bearing ewe you could expect to lose up to sort of three and a half uh, percent of those ewes, whereas a, a single bearing ewe, uh, as uh, Hamish pointed out, is quite resilient. And so you might be might have a mortality more like closer to 1%. However, if we um, if these animals uh, lose too much condition in that latter stages of pregnancy, uh, we see here that the mortalities uh, jump quite dramatically. So the um, uh, even single bearing ewes, uh, you might be losing 4%. Whereas uh, ewes that are um, twin bearing ewes uh, can be as high as 6% at score two. And uh, and obviously below score two, um, the ewe mortalities you can see here uh, do jump up quite dramatically. And so um, under the Lifetime Ewe Management Program, as uh, some of you would be aware, we, we aim to keep ewes in about score three condition through pregnancy and ideally certainly uh, th around about score three or a bit better at the time of lambing. Now, of course, um, in normal years where you've got uh, green feed at that stage uh, and you've got some reasonable carryover conditions from the uh, late spring, early summer period, that's quite achievable. Whereas in these years, uh, it really comes back to how much supplement you've been able to give them. And, uh, and Hamish explained the, energy, the exact energy requirements. Uh, this is illustrated just in another diagram here which highlights that um, we talk about um, use in poor condition having high mortality rates but it can also be a, a situation, um, certainly not this year probably, but um, in other years where animals that are in over-conditioned uh, can also have a higher mortality rate. So just as animals that are in have low body fat uh, are quite susceptible to um, mortality, uh, use that are in exceptionally fat. Um, over uh, score four or above are also tend to be less resilient and more susceptible to um, uh, mortality. Okay, so now I'd like to move on to um, 
some of the uh, particular diseases we uh, we have mentioned. So if we start off with uh, pregnancy toxemia, or as it is um, sort of colloquially known as twin lamb disease, because primarily it's it's used that they've got twins or triplets that are most vulnerable to pregnancy toxemia. So what's the cause? So effectively, it's a it is a progressive starvation. In other words, they have an energy deficit in the last six weeks of pregnancy, but this is obviously they can be have been going on for for several weeks before that. And uh, the trouble is, in the last six weeks, when all the lamb growth is occurring uh, and they have a high energy demand for that uh, lamb growth, plus the maintenance of the ewe, uh, it's, it just gets too much, and uh, the ewe's energy reserves in the form of fat or condition is uh, rapidly depleted. And the consequences of um, high utilisation of the animal's uh, own body reserves in fat uh, is that they develop a uh, sort of a dull or depressed um, disposition. They might wander around aimlessly and look a bit ataxic or staggery and eventually they'll become recumbent. Uh, and at this stage, because there's a lot of the um, byproducts of fat digestion in the system, it tends to depress appetite. Uh, and so they're not, they become disinterested in eating anyway, even if you put food in front of them, grain or, or whatever. Uh, and usually this period only lasts for about one to three days and they, uh, they'll go become comatose and die. And uh, so it's particularly in animals that have got twins or triplets, uh, as Hamish said, uh, used with single lambs are usually very resilient and even in poor condition can often survive these circumstances. Although I understand obviously in some of the pastoral country this year, a lot of the ewes have basically dropped their lambs and walked away because they've been in such poor condition. Uh, the other consequences you see, if you do a post-mortem on a ewe that's had, um, that has died from pregnancy toxemia, you'll see that there's basically very little or no body fat uh, in the carcass and uh, or around the kidneys, for example, where obviously, obviously you tend to look for um, fat conditions. And so the consequences, um, so if we do a post-mortem, and it's probably the quickest way to work out what um, has caused the ewe, to death, uh, and obviously you'll see the evidence of um, usually twins or sometimes triplets, no body fat, and the liver is very pale and friable. So what do we mean by friable? Basically, if you uh, pick the liver up with your fingers, your fingers will just go straight through it like a bit like paper mache, and and, uh, and it's also very discoloured. So it's often ochre coloured or um, chamois coloured, uh, which is just in typical of a uh, liver that's been digesting a lot of fat, and uh, so yeah, that's uh, what you'll always find with a pregnancy toxemia. Um, I can't say I've ever done a post-mortem on a, on a sheep and found a single lamb in the case of pregnancy toxemia. Uh, so what can, do, can we do about it? Uh, treatment, um, you know, unfortunately, because it's been a progressive loss of uh, energy over a period of time, it's actually, there's no quick fix. And it's going to be a progressive re-establishment of the energy in the animal. So if the animal's um, still standing and somnolent or looking depressed and uh, a bit dull, well then you've got a reasonable chance by treating it with uh, glucose and propylene glycol of restoring it um, back to its um, normal self. Uh, if it's already recumbent, um, and perhaps down on its side, well, the chances are very slim of getting a recovery. Uh, what we normally do would be giving it a sort of, um, we'd normally give it a four in one, which is the um, uh, mixture of glucose and calcium, magnesium and phosphorus, uh, just as a, uh, I guess, as a shotgun therapy, if we use that term, uh, and that can be given under the skin. Um, it can be given intravenously, but there's a risk of causing a heart, heart attack, so it's uh, probably only best done by someone with a lot of experience, such as a vet. Um, the, probably the most important aspect is the uh, propylene glycol. You can also give glucose injections, intravenous glucose. Once again, it's not something that would normally uh, be done unless you've got experience in that field, but also glucose only tends to last in the body for about four to six hours, and so it's not really, a, it's only a short-term fix, it's not a, um, a long-term therapy. Uh, so that's where the propylene glycol comes in uh, and that uh, comes under a number of different names. There's a, um, a ketol or acetol, a number of other products and the uh, propylene glycol is a sort of a longer acting uh, energy source. So it's, depending on what the concentration is, um, it usually might be about 100 mil and that's given orally and we'd normally give that twice a day. And so if you can keep the animal propped up so that they don't regurgitate their um, 
stomach contents uh, and give them the uh, propylene glycol twice a day. Uh, it may take several days, even a week, um, to get that animal to recover, but um, there's certainly no promises. It's uh, often probably a 50-50 chance of getting survival. Uh, in terms of prevention, uh, well, I guess that's probably already been stated in terms of um, maintaining use in better condition. And is the only way to really avoid this problem so that the animal has adequate energy reserves um, in the lead up to pre in lead up to lactation and avoiding all stress in the last four, four weeks. So obviously not shearing or crutching, uh, not yarding or droving uh, and preferably not even drenching or um, vaccinating because that should ideally be done at least four weeks before lambing because any stress at this stage is what can tip them over the edge uh, and uh, predispose to this problem. Okay, other conditions that might be encountered, so milk fever uh, or hypocalcemia. So that's um, sometimes actually presents very similarly to um, uh, pregnancy toxemia. And uh, so we see that um, once again, in this case, it's a mineral deficiency in the last six to eight weeks of pregnancy. Uh, and that can be brought about by a number of different conditions. There are a lot of different aspects, but one of them in these sort of years is where there's been a lot of grain feeding going on without a calcium supplement. And typically a calcium supplement would be limestone or lime. And uh, sometimes uh, in other situations, it can be grazing crops or lush grass without a supplement has a similar impact. And certainly any stress in the lead up to uh, lactation or lambing, uh, such as yarding or droving, can also predispose to it. So here we see typically an animal that's um, quite dull and depressed, uh, recumbent. The difference, I guess, with um, milk fever is the recumbency is, is um, sternal. In other words, they're sort of lying on their brisket as opposed to lying flat out, which is probably more the case with pregnancy toxemia. Uh, they also tend to be a bit somnolent and uh, inappetent. And uh, once again, they will lapse into a, a coma after a day or so and uh, usually die if, if they're not treated. The advantage with, um, uh, and perhaps the other aspect here is that um, once again, they're usually animals that have uh, got twins that are more likely to succumb to uh, milk fever or twins or triplets. And you can see in this case, the animal's still got quite a bit of fat around the, um, the abdomen and uh, so as opposed to what we might see with pregnancy toxemia, uh, but the liver can still be um, quite friable. In this particular instance where I took these photos, um, it was a case where these um, late pregnant ewes had been yarded overnight for a bit of um, um, husbandry issues. And anyway, that was just enough to tip them over the edge, taking them off their um, source of energy and uh, calcium. Uh, for a, a 12 to 24 hour period was enough to cause them to lapse into hypercalcemia. And uh, so just like um, animals need energy every day, um, they also need their mineral intake. And, uh, and so this can happen uh, just because there's been a, a lot of uh, grain being fed in the diet without a calcium supplement. However, we can, they do respond to treatment, so we can give them once again the four in one, which includes calcium, uh, 100 mil under the skin. Uh, and we may repeat this at, uh, later in the day if it uh, hasn't been in response, but usually the animals can recover and, and may get up and walk away within a half an hour of that treatment. Uh, a follow-up treatment with a bit of propylene glycol, the same as with Pregtox, just to uh, ensure that their uh, energy reserves are being met, uh, can also be an advantage. How do we prevent it? So providing um, calcium in the diet, as I said, this is normally provided as um, stock lime or limestone, uh, and also vitamin D. Uh, especially um, in more in the winter months when there's less sunlight around, vitamin D certainly stimulates better uptake and, re and retention of calcium in the system. Uh, so this can be given um, four to eight weeks prior to lambing. Uh, and once again, uh, avoiding stress in that late pregnancy period. If we move on now to uh, enterotoxemia, so pulpy kidney. So just to make the distinction, often people get pregnancy toxemia and enterotoxemia confused. Uh, and it is confusing because the names are a bit the same. But uh, so obviously pregnancy toxemia applies to, um, it's a lack of energy in the latter stages of pregnancy, whereas enterotoxemia is as the name suggests, entero, so it's involving the intestines. And the toxemia is actually a blood poisoning brought about by uh, clostridium uh, clostridial organisms, in this case, clostridium perfringens. So these uh, lovely little pink rods all stained up in this slide here is the actual organism. Uh, 
and these are normally present in the diet or in the in the intestine and uh, provided um, there's no dramatic changes in the diet, uh, they don't usually cause any problems. But as soon as you, um, say, move the animals from hay onto grain or from um, dry feed onto green feed, uh, that can just disrupt the throughput of the um, intestinal contents sufficient for these organisms to multiply and release a toxin which will cause this um, sudden death. So as the uh, slide shows here, uh, this, these are actually hoggets that have been uh, yarded overnight for um, uh, handling a husbandry procedure. They were hungry, they were let out into, um, in this case it was capeweed and they gorged themselves on the capeweed and uh, ended up dying from enterotoxemia. So that's always a danger when you've got um, any significant change in diet, whether it's going from dry feed to green feed or from dry feed uh, from hay to grain or um, from native pasture to lush green feed. All those situations can predispose to enterotoxemia. And uh, typically you'll only find the animals dead because it is a very sudden death. Uh, sometimes you may find them standing off um, on their own with a painful stance or like a colic stance. Uh, and the other typical thing is when they when they die, sometimes you'll see this um, blood tinged froth at the nostrils. Uh, that's just typical because it's um, when it's it's a very toxic situation and uh, they die with rapid breathing and the rapid breathing causes a lot of mucus um, to exude from the uh, the nostrils. Uh, and usually, uh, because there's a sort of multiple hemorrhages, um, you'll also get some blood tinge in that mucus. Uh, and so typically the body uh, enlarges or blows up quite rapidly. Uh, so the decomposition is quite, um, it's almost occurring before the animal dies. There's really no treatment in Australia for this product. There is an antitoxin, uh, but we don't actually have it in Australia. Um, and probably you, you wouldn't get to it in time to treat in most situations anyway. But certainly the prevention is quite, um, practical and hopefully most people do it. So vaccinating with the um, 3-in-1 or the 5-in-1. Um, so there's uh, a Webster vaccine, there's also the um, uh, Zoetis um, Glanvac uh, vaccines uh, and 3-in-1 covers the uh, enterotoxemia, although some people only stock the 5-in-1 line or the 6-in-1 line, so it's whatever you can get hold of. And we normally recommend two vaccinations, firstly at marking and then two to four weeks later, or four to six weeks later, perhaps, uh, or at weaning. And uh, whenever you're actually moving livestock onto uh, lush green feed or um, changing their diet dramatically, we suggest giving a booster. But certainly there should be a booster given at least annually uh, and preferably to use um, you know, four weeks or more before lambing so that they're then passing on their uh, passive antibody immunity through the um, a colostrum and early milk supply to the lambs. Okay, <clears throat> next, um, mastitis. Now I've come across a few cases recently of mastitis being reported uh, and normally we associate mastitis with um, perhaps exceptionally wet conditions when ewes are, got, uh, are lactating quite profusely <clears throat> or high yielding, but uh, we can also see it in these situations where animals are being confinement fed or feedlot fed and there's been a lot of dust around and so there's an increased risk of um, the causative bacteria. There's a number of which are in the environment normally uh, or on the skin and uh, these are readily spread by dust um, and it's just a matter of getting access through the uh, teat canal and the, uh, to the other or sometimes the organisms are once again in the bloodstream already and it's just um, circumstances which cause them to lodge in the udder and cause a problem. So all breeds of sheep are affected, uh, certainly some of the higher producing British breeds are perhaps more susceptible and uh, sometimes it can be coincide with a scabby mouth infection where perhaps the lambs get the scabby mouth, they suck on the teat, they spread the uh, scabby mouth to the udder and that causes um, damage to the uh, sphincter in the uh, teat and allows the teat boy organisms to enter through the teat canal. So I've seen that on the odd occasion as well. What are the signs? So typically uh, an enlarged udder, so just like we can see here in this uh, circumstance, uh, large deformed and often it's hard or it can be cold in some situations. You may find the lambs are looking a bit hungry because they're not getting the, the feed that they were hoping for and if it's a particular organisms get in the udder they can cause blood poisoning and, and sort of death in the ewes. Uh, so that's uh, it happens occasionally also. <coughs> Treatment, um, antibiotics, um, there's a number of antibiotics that um, the, uh, will assist the um, situation and uh, anti-inflammatories which um, 
can uh, help to reduce the pain and the, uh, the suffering on behalf of the animal. Antibiotics, there's a number of different antibiotics which will be quite effective. And in terms of prevention, there's really no obvious means by which we can prevent this disease, but certainly close monitoring of use and uh, detecting and treating infection early before um, you know, too, many, too many animals get affected. The little slide here just highlights that um, this was uh, three different ewes that had mastitis in the same mob and they all had different coloured milk. So the, um, the uh, discharge you get from a mastitic um, udder, uh, the colour doesn't really give you much idea of what the, uh, the particular causative organism is, but highlights the fact that um, obviously the milk is very uh, discoloured and sometimes clotted. Um, and so just by feeling the other, you can usually have a pretty good idea whether there's a mastitis issue and probably the earlier you get antibiotics into those animals, the better. Rightio, so uh, next I was going to talk about pink eye. So a common problem in most livestock, uh, so ovine infectious keratoconjunctivitis in this case. Um, the organism that causes pink eye in sheep uh, is actually generally different from those that cause pink eye in cattle. Uh, and so whilst we might have um, uh, the penicillin pink eye treatment of quite effective in cattle, often it's not, not effective in sheep because it's a different organism. And so the uh, mycoplasma or rickettsia uh, organisms, um, so whilst the lesions can appear similar to cattle, um, the causative organism is often different. Once again, spread by dust and flies, insects, and sometimes can be associated with grass seeds as grass seeds lodging in the eye. So typically we see the um, cloudy cornea develop and almost films like, seems like a skin develops over the eye and, uh, and sometimes in advanced cases where you get this increased vas vascularisation, uh, you'll get this fleshy growth over the eye and it looks quite um, well, unappealing I suppose, quite painful. But interesting enough that most animals um, will recover in 10 to 14 days, they tend to get over it. But one of the problems is if it does get this severely fleshy growth on the eyeball that um, the animal can puncture it on sticks or, or fences or whatever and so you get this uh, eye rupture which is obviously um, not a good outcome. Uh, from a treatment point of view, oxytetracycline is considered perhaps the best um, treatment uh, overall. Now a lot of people do use uh, puffer packs or sprays but unfortunately with tetracycline uh, they, they probably only last about 12 hours and it's probably um, not being very useful giving them a squirt in the eye with the uh, purple spray or, or the puffer pack for that matter. You're probably better off giving them a shot of long-acting uh, oxytetracycline uh, in the muscle. Uh, at least that will have a three days residual benefit and have some benefit in treating the infection. Whereas just giving them a squirt with a, um, a pressure pack is probably not going to be, unless you do it repeatedly over a number of days, it's really not going to have much benefit. So once again, prevention, hard to prevent because of the obvious uh, causal organisms and uh, situations in which it develops. But close monitoring of sheep um, and certainly getting early treatment, perhaps isolating those that might have uh, pink eyes if it's being spread by flies, for example. Uh, but that's often not very practical. Rightio. Well, I think that's about all I had to say. So just summing up. Um, so if there's excessive grain feeding, or not excessive, but grain feeding has been going on for more than a month or two, uh, certainly providing a um, mineral supplement with calcium and one that's been uh, relatively popular has been a mixture of lime, dolomite and salt which is obviously giving calcium from the lime, uh, magnesium from the dolomite and also calcium from dolomite and salt is just a, really a stimulant to get them to eat it. So a 40-40-20 uh, mix uh, which you can actually mix or otherwise you can certainly buy a proprietary substance, uh, uh, supplements the same. Uh, vitamin A, D and E, uh, certainly the vitamin D is useful to prevent hypocalcemia uh, and vitamin A is actually quite useful to um, uh, basically ensure better eye health and so vitamin A is actually considered a, a good preventative for um, pink eye but certainly no guarantees. Um, so all these can be best given in that sort of four to six weeks before lambing. Uh, as we said, clostridial vaccines um, certainly four to six weeks before lambing and then other risk periods where you're putting them having a significant change in diet. Um, when they are on lush green feed, obviously not this year, um, providing ad lib hay straw or roughage um, can be an advantage and uh, that's really just trying to um, often on lush green feed alone they are actually mineral deficient and sometimes they can be fibre deficient. Uh, 
uh, as a general preventative, um, having a, a knowledge of your soil or pasture or fodder uh, feed situations or mineral content so that you can actually um, arrange for preventative strategies. So for example, you can test pasture to see what the mineral content is and so you can see if there's a predisposition to, um, for example, hypocalcemia, milk fever. Uh, and certainly at testing soil and pasture, you can address, say, phosphorus levels or calcium levels, which may have long-term preventative benefits in, in terms of growing more feed, but also a better balance for livestock to meet their uh, needs in late pregnancy and lactation. And similarly, um, you can use pasture analysis and or blood or liver analysis to see if they, what their um, trace element needs might be or for that matter macro element needs uh, and so you may look to um, doing some supplementation through fertilisers or foliar sprays or drenches or licks or water medications, whatever may um, suit the need. Okay, on that point, um, I think I've got to finish up before my, my PowerPoint uh, dies on me another time. So um, open to questions, thank you. Thanks Colin. A um, few questions coming through. So I've got a question from a producer on Air Peninsula where they had locked up twinning ewes that were going down and not been able to get up. They were being fed um, barley and high protein wheat and good quality hay and using a range of mag for salt, stock lime and um, in a mix and wondering what else they could have done to improve this situation. The ewes were in probably fat score four. Um, yeah, wondering if there's something else they may could have done in that situation. Okay, well it sounds like um, they had most of the all bases covered really um, and I'm actually wondering if you're saying fat score four it might have been an issue that um, they were perhaps in too good a condition and uh, and I would be uh, in that scenario I'd certainly be if they're not being stressed I mean obviously if they are being locked up uh, stress shouldn't be an issue uh, I would be wondering about the um, the the macro element balance in the system. So I mentioned about calcium. Uh, another one is magnesium um, and they both can cause use to go down uh, if they're not if they don't have the, I guess, the right amount. So that's what we don't really know. I guess one of the problems with providing licks is that um, it's obviously a general uh, remedy, a bit of a shotgun therapy, but we don't know necessarily how much the animals are eating. And so it could well be that, um, as I said, there's a number of factors that have impact on whether an animal suffers from milk fever. For example, once they uh, are beyond about four years of age, they tend to be more susceptible because they're, um, they're less able to absorb um, uh, calcium and for that matter magnesium from the food they're eating. Uh, and the other issue is that's in relation to how much phosphorus is in the system. So um, if, for example, they're on a high phosphorus diet, they're going to be more predisposed to a, a calcium magnesium deficiency. And for that matter, if they're on a salt deficient diet, they're also more predisposed to a calcium and magnesium deficiency. Uh, and then the third factor can be um, if they're on a high potassium diet, that also predisposes to um, calcium and magnesium deficiency. So um, whilst it would just um, the scenario painted would seem that they had they were flush with everything uh, it would be hard to um, you would have to really look at the, the dietary analysis to have a better idea of what was going on uh, and perhaps the um, clinical signs or symptoms that they were showing when they went down. If they were just going down and looking somberlant or dull, depressed and uh, then I would have thought they, uh, and probably just treating with four in one, uh, may have been enough to um, get a response. And so your diagnosis would be that it was actually um, more likely calcium deficiency. If they uh, were not responding to any treatments, well, then you'd be wondering, you know, is it still a pregnancy toxemia situation? Uh, whilst we talked about pregnancy toxemia being associated with primarily animals in very poor condition, uh, you can actually get it in animals that are in very fat condition too, uh, ones that have been off their tucker for um, 12 hours. So for example, for a yarding or even rough weather, uh, anything that stops them eating for 12 hours, um, sometimes it's the, actually the animals that are over conditioned or fat um, that are more susceptible um, to that lack of um, dietary intake and uh, it can start causing the uh, fat catabolism, which then is a bit of a downward spiral. Um, I realise that's a long-winded answer to the question, uh, 
but I'd be happy to speak to the producer afterwards if um, if they'd like to go into more detail about that. But thanks for that, Colin. I'll um, grab the email address off the producer and pass it on to you. Um, another question here for Hamish. Mm -hmm. Million dollar question. How often do sheep need to be fed whilst in confinement? And is there a different answer for twins and single use? Yeah, the million dollar question for sure. It's um, the basic rule of thumb is the more often they can, or the more uh, regular access they can have to grain, the better. Now, overlaid over the top of that, then just comes into play the practicalities of how it can be done um, with both the facilities that you've got at hand and your labour resources. So. As much as possible, um, we try to keep a consistent grain intake. So if you're feeding high amounts of grain, um, because it's it, it's either the most cost-effective ration or you've got potentially twins that have got a high demand, then often feeding three times a week if you're trail feeding can be sufficient. But one of the things to keep in mind is not just how regularly you're feeding, but also how long is that grain that you're feeding out lasting. Um, so commonly when you feed out, it's not all cleaned up within half an hour. You know, often it may stay there longer, particularly when you're feeding high rates. So if you're finding that they still actually have, you know, and they're cleaning up the last bits of grain the day after you've fed out, and they don't actually have a very long period in between feeds of, of going completely without grain, then that's quite okay. Um, they do start to lose a lot of that adaptation to grain, even after 24 hours. So if they haven't had access to grain at all, um, for that period, then you need to start thinking about can you increase the regularity of feeding to minimise the upset or the, or, the, or the rumen upset in terms of the fluctuations in, in starch content from the grain coming in and out, which also leads to the, to the point of view of you need to consider what type of feed you're providing as well. So what is the starch content of the grain that you're using? So clearly if you're using something like wheat, which is high starch, with a higher acidosis risk, then you need to be far more careful about how you manage the feeding. And in that situation, more regular feeding is far preferable. Um, with a lower starch feed, then you can start to get away with le less regular feeding if it's if it's really required. Um, that can be one of the one of the advantages of using you know feeders where they have um, regular ad lib access to 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 grain to minimise the fluctuations in pH. It's been interesting looking at um, uh, a research feedlot that we have where headspace, the ration that you utilise, um, are severely impacting production on a, in a feedlot sense, and we see similar results even in, in containment. And I think it's actually really important that we, we try and ensure that stock have uh, good access to, to grain. And I think one of the things that we often push a little bit too hard is where we're using grain mixes. Um, we need to make sure that there's lots of access to that feed for animals. Um, because if we don't, and particularly where we have a, a, a hotter ration, so higher starch content, we tend to push a bigger spread in the in the weight and the condition score of animals. Um, the other thing to think about is is what is the hay that you're using? And even probably related to that, that previous question, if you're using really good quality hay, then sometimes you actually um, have animals that will prefer to sit on hay less so than grain. And if you have animals that are fluctuating in terms of their intake to hay to grain and back and forward rather than a consistent intake of both, then that can cause issues in terms of acidosis or, or, or certainly big fluctuations in their performance. So it's just part of the consideration. One following on to that, Hamish, is uh, if people are looking for more information on setting, setting up a confinement feeding area or drought lot, what sort of publications would you recommend? Um, I think in terms of the, the base principles of, of setting up containment areas or feedlots, there's a number of fact sheets online that are worth looking at. So the Adelaide Mount Lofty Rangers NRM put out a, a quite a useful containment and feedlot or containment area fact sheet earlier in this year, which has um, some good information on the basic design principles and some management aspects. Um, AWI has a, a publication put together for setting up drought lots, which is, which is really useful. MLA has the national guidelines, which are probably more designed um, at the feedlotting space, but they certainly, many of the principles apply to a containment area just as much. Um, and those national guidelines go into a, a, a lot of detail um, and, and cover off on sort of all aspects of of set up and approvals and management a little bit as well. So um, those aspects are there. 
Um, so yeah, so I think probably the, the starting point is is probably jump online and, and have a look at a few of those resources and some of the departments of ag around the country have some, some fact sheets as well. Thank you. Um, one for you, Colin. What's the maximum number of weeks prior to lambing um, to drench and vaccinate ewes? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Look, normally we'd say that um, with, with a vaccine, if the animals have had their uh, primary or previous vaccines in previous years, um, you'll get a response to a vaccine within uh, 24 hours. Uh, and so the antibody levels will jump quite up. Uh, up. But um, yeah, that's right, the longer you um, space that away from actual lambing, um, I guess there's a reduction in the amount of antibodies that potentially is passed through in the milk. However, uh, I would suggest that ideally um, four weeks four weeks before lambing is an ideal time to uh, do any drenching or vaccinating uh, and probably uh, you know up to eight weeks uh, and you're still going to get quite good benefit uh, with uh, both vaccines and drenches. Now having, having said that um, I would normally be doing I'd be recommending an egg count doing a worm egg count to see if they do need a drench um, in the term in from the form of antalmidic or worm drenching. Um, so I'd be doing a worm egg count about six weeks before lambing just to see if they do have a, a high level. Now I realise that in certain circumstances people will always want to give a pre-lambing drench just from a, a, a risk management point of view, uh, peace of mind. But um, yeah, it may well have been this year that um, they wouldn't have had any worms in them. Although having uh, feeding lamb, uh, sheep in confinement feeding or feedlots, uh, there's actually an increased risk that they will pick up worms. But uh, of course, every every mob is different. You don't really know unless you do a worm egg count. So for um, you know, 25 or 30 dollars, I think it's a, it's a good uh, investment to work out whether they need a worm drench. But certainly from a vaccine point of view, look, I'd suggest any time, you know, probably ideally four to six weeks before lambing is a is a good time to do it. And you should still get a very adequate uh, antibody uh, transmission through in the milk um, to cover the lamb in their first uh, six weeks of life. Um, one more, and I might make this our last one because I'm aware that we've gone over time. Um, Colin, does wool length have a role in vitamin D deficiency and how how do sheep generally get vitamin D requirements? Okay, yeah, look, um, you'll actually, the, uh, certainly vitamin D is acquired by the sun interacting with bare skin uh, and I don't think actually wool length is considered a significant issue. Interestingly enough, I went to the uh, Australian Society of Animal Production conference in Wagga last uh, two weeks ago, and uh, one of the producer, one of the speakers there, was saying that um, even cattle in at Catherine in Northern Territory can get vitamin D deficiency in the middle of winter, uh, and so it's not actually uh, necessarily a um, how will cover, but it's more to do with the fact of the angle of the um, the sun in the winter, the winter sun, and so um, and our latitude. So anywhere below about 36 degrees latitude, uh, animals are at risk to vitamin D deficiency uh, across all all breeds and species, and uh, so it's more. Um, and whilst vitamin D plays an important role in calcium. Uh, resorption and retention in the body um, it's only one of the um, one of the factors so um, I would suggest that um, a vitamin D a D and E injection at probably at a similar time to vaccination is probably a, a good thing just from a management point of view I'd like to thank Hamish and Colin for your presentations tonight um, we have a few more questions that have come in I'll um, flick those through to Colin and Hamish after the webinar and endeavour to get you an answer via email. So we thank you all for your attendance at tonight's webinar. We'd like to acknowledge our funding from AWI, Primary Industries in Region, South Australia, and the Sheep Industry um, Fund. So thank you and we look forward to jo you joining us at our next webinar. Good night and have a lovely evening.